want to welcome you to uh, Ball State's 16th Annual uh, Yom HaShoah, or the Holocaust Days of Remem Remembrance. Uh, I'm David Kamins, part of the committee that's responsible year after year for this. Uh, Judy Coor and Dick Fears are also part of our, our team. <coughs> I'm pleased to introduce Hyleen Flansbaum, uh, who will speak to us this evening, and I think bring a different approach to uh, Yom HaShoah than we've had in the past. Uh, she's an associate professor of uh, American Literature at Butler University. She regularly teaches a course on literature of the Holocaust. I believe she's a director of the Creative Writing Program there as well. And as a result of her work, she's edited and contributed to the Americanization of the Holocaust, a John Hopkins, Hopkins publication in 1999, and a forthcoming anthology on Jewish American literature from Norton. Currently, she's working on a project that I think we'll probably see a little bit about tonight. I'm not sure. She's working on a book titled, to, at least tentative title, to, to Avert One's Gaze, The Holocaust in the American 50s. And some of you may have seen our article in Indianapolis Monthly, February of this year. Within an Inch of My Life was the title. And I think it suggests what this new project is all about and maybe a little bit of what we're going to hear today. I don't know. Uh, the reason she's here is because of that article. My wife subscribes to Indiana, Indianapolis Monthly. I read it periodically. I saw the article, and the rest is history. Her talk tonight is a, a subject of her work over the recent years, the changing face of the Holocaust. And I think it's a hint of the nature of the intellectual inquiry taking place among scholars today. Some might recall that a month ago we had an historian here who talked about the Americanization of the Holocaust part of the scholarly trend I think that's going on. And I'm sure all of you, or certainly most of you, have seen Schindler's List and the more recent Life is Beautiful, uh, two very recent films uh, that have shown our perception of the Holocaust is undergoing a change as we ourselves, I guess, are, are changing. So I think without further ado, I'll step aside and, and present Eileen Plansbaum. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, one of the things that motivated this paper actually was seeing the movie Life is Beautiful, which I'll confess right away, I really liked. Um, I hope you liked it too, because I'm going to argue very vociferously in its behalf. And I was really kind of consistently annoyed by the reviews of it, which were complaining. And I started to think to myself, what is that about? Um, in the process, I was also working, as Dave mentioned, uh, on my book, which is about the 50s and how the Holocaust was perceived in the 50s, um, as opposed to now in the O's, I guess is what people say. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, but you'll see. Um, the second half of the paper is more noticeably about Life is Beautiful, so you might have to be a little patient until I get there, but this is kind of the warm-up. And actually, I'm going to begin the talk with an anecdote told to me by a friend of mine who is a professor at the University of Utah, also a poet. Her name is Jackie Asherow, for those of you who might know the name. And she's married to the son of a Holocaust survivor. And she told me this story. It took place in 1993, the year that Schindler's List was released. And Jackie, who had gotten leery of seeing Hollywood movies about the Holocaust and was really sick to death of hearing all the hype surrounding the movie, had decided not to see it. And her father-in-law, the survivor, and his friends, who were all survivors too, would not stop bugging her about it. Every time they saw her for months, they would say, Jackie, Jackie, did you see it? Did you see it? And she would say, no, no, no. But finally, she felt pressured, so she went to see it. And the next time she sees her father-in-law and her friends, they ask her again. So she tells them that she has seen it and that she didn't like it and says to them, why did you tell me to see it? It wasn't good. It wasn't anything like the way you told me the Holocaust was, to which they reply, of course it wasn't, but wasn't it terrific? Um, and, and truthfully, I don't have to use Jackie's story because I have heard similar stories myself from survivors. Two years ago for Yom HaShoah, I visited the U.S. Holocaust Museum to give a talk for them, and several survivors and children of survivors were in the audience, and at one point when we got to talking, about the now infamous 1978 miniseries Holocaust. I don't know how many of you saw it. Um, what customarily happens, happens, and that is that the conversation immediately turned to criticizing it for being trivial, for being too lighthearted, 
or soft pedaling, the devastation, etc. And while this conversation was happening, one middle-aged son of a survivor in the audience and an historian for the museum volunteered that his mother had loved it. When questioned further about how this could be, be the case, he replied that his mother loved anything that dealt with the Holocaust, and she was just gratified to see it in public view. Had we spoken to his mother, I am certain that she would not have attested to the likeness of this program to her own experience, quite the contrary, I am certain she would have said that it was nothing like what she had gone through, and that to go a step further, nothing could or ever would be. Um, I tell these stories because I believe that the reactions of survivors to artistic representations of the Holocaust ought to be instructive to us as viewers and critics. I think that what these anecdotes reveal is that this notion of realism this absolute, absolute commitment to veracity, to accuracy, to fully exposing the horrors of the Holocaust is in some ways hopelessly misguided, futile, and in a crucial way beside the point. Um, the tendency of contemporary critics to insist upon this kind of historical verisimilitude, you know, this one-for-one -one correspondence between what happened and the representation, is is futile and detrimental to the ent enterprise of Holocaust studies and to Holocaust awareness. Not that artists should stop representing the Holocaust in any particular way he or she sees it, but rather that we need to stop critiquing representations of the Holocaust as if one criterion and one criterion alone mattered, and that is how close does it come to documenting the actual event. Critics treat representations of the Holocaust, whether in film or literature, as if they all aspire to be documentary evidence, and that someday some particularly brilliant artist will be able to capture it in total, and it will be for the reader or for the viewer as if she or he were actually there. To put the matter more simply, what is going on when Abraham Foxman, who is president of the Anti-Defamation League and a Holocaust survivor himself, endorses a movie like Life is Beautiful, while critics across the country condemn it, because in one reviewer's words that typify many, it is not a valid depiction of the Holocaust. In the past 20 years, professional film critics, literary critics, and cultural critics have cleaved to this notion of truth. In other words, the question, how close did it actually come to representing the true horror, has been paramount in an evaluative scale. In this talk, I am going to try to explain why I believe this is a mistake and why such a mistake compromises Holocaust awareness in this country and why it has exposed some brilliant artworks like Schindler's List and Life is Beautiful to unnecessary and destructive controversy. The first step in challenging this evaluative criterion of absolute and unmediated verisimilitude is to note that Holocaust art has not always prized realism above all else. In the 40s, 50s, and 60s, such a virtue barely existed for critics. In each of these decades, one could argue, artists and critics have had a different agenda for what representations of the Holocaust ought to do. I don't have time here to go into this in detail, although I do have a theory about each um, decade, and we, we can talk about that in our discussion, I think, in some ways. Um, will be interested in that. But for now, I, I just want to suffice to say that the Holocaust has changed and continues to change, at least as it has been portrayed by artists, but the critics have not moved forward with the artists. Let me provide one particular example. Let's go back about 35 years and look at a movie that I hope some of you have seen called The Pawn Broker. Anybody? Okay. Um, a landmark in Holocaust art. For those of you who don't remember the movie or weren't around then, let me briefly say a few things about the movie. Um, famous for being the first American movie to put a Holocaust survivor on the screen, the title character, Saul Nazerman, played by Rod Steiger, lives as the film opens with his family in Long Island. He runs a barely profitable pawn shop in a bad neighborhood in New York City, Harlem, I believe. Nazerman has an assistant, an impoverished Latino, who sees the pawnbroker only as a rich Jew. And every day, this character challenges the limits of his boss's generosity and open-mindedness. The movie and the book, which at first was, 
was universally praised, nominated for several Academy Awards. Critics called it intelligent, sensitive, moving, and unrelenting in its realism. The American Jewish community embraced it wholeheartedly. By today's standards of verisimilitude, however, this film would hardly pass muster. For first and foremost, The Pawnbroker is a study of racism and compares the persecution of the Jews in Europe to the discrimination against ethnic groups in this country. Yet for American Jews and for Holocaust studies, it was an important moment. One of the truly groundbreaking things in the movie was not only that it featured a survivor as its main character, it included the unpopular perception that he or she was not over his suffering, that they were still experiencing and re-experiencing the trauma. This in itself constituted a major break in representations of the Holocaust. The silence of survivors in the years following the war is by now well documented. I refer everyone to Hank Greenspan's Listening to Survivors, which is a new book about this. But I'll give you an overview and say that Greenspan and others have told us that survivors said very little in the years immediately following the war. First, because they did not believe that most Americans, including their own families, wanted to hear these stories. Second, they thought no one could gain anything from those memories being shared, that they would only burden the next generation with such you know, horrible stories. Moreover, as new Americans, Holocaust survivors felt that they had been asked to forget, to assimilate, to move on, to join the prosperity and cheerfulness of the 50s. And as we all know, in the 50s, representation representations of the Holocaust exemplify these ideals. Um, you might all think of Anne Frank's diary, for instance, in the way that was produced on Broadway, which certainly has gotten its share of critical attention these days, so I won't say anything more about it. But the pawnbroker in 1965 defies these trends. It represents a turning point in representing the Holocaust because it tells us that victims of the Holocaust were Jewish. Um, and this in itself is a milestone. Um, yes, they were American, they are Americans now, but they are all noticeably Jewish in terms of ethnic inflection, costume, and religious observance. And second, the movie did not attempt to hide the fact that survivors were actually suffering still. And third, most crucially perhaps, it actually takes the viewer inside a concentration camp. Nazerman remembers in what has most popular, popularly been called flashbacks. And in his flashbacks, both he and the viewer get to see a very tiny piece of what he has seen, the inside of the camps. The way these flashbacks appear is an illustrative moment in Jewish American cultural history. Nazarene cannot remember either too long or too much, and it certainly seems as if he had his way, he would remember nothing at all. But he can't help it. When the flashbacks come, he is in their thrall. In this way, he aptly symbolizes the society at large, that is suddenly forced to remember but cannot look for too long. If the 50s were characterized by looking away, by averting one's gaze from the horror, then the 60s, after the Eichmann trial perhaps, are characterized by this metaphor of flashback, a slow coming to consciousness, a kind of waking up on the part of the Jewish American community. Were the pawnbroker to be released today, however, and judged by today's standards of absolute ver verisimilitude and representation, the depiction of the concentration camp, and one certainly thinks here of Schindler's List in Spielberg's painstaking attempts to get it just right. You probably remember reading a lot of articles about this, of how Spielberg you know, went to Poland and labored to get the exact details right. Um, this would make the pawnbroker seem inadequate and unrealistic. One also might be reminded here of complaints about the way the concentration camp is rendered in Life is Beautiful, but, but we'll get to that in, in a minute or so. Critics would also complain that the focus of the film, which is a good deal, perhaps even predominantly on race relations in America, gives short shrift to the Holocaust, and that in magnitude, scope, and effect, the Holocaust must not be compared to American racism. As you all probably know by now, one of the major controversies in Holocaust studies has been the uniqueness argument. That is, whether the Holocaust is a unique in event, incomparable to other political atrocities, or whether or not it makes sense to talk about it in relation to American slavery, um, for instance, or the war in Bosnia. For those of you who don't know, this is actually what stalled the progress of the United States Holocaust Memorial and Museum, this precise argument, whether the Holocaust could be related to other events in history or whether it needed to be. Okay. 
But it is crucial to observe that in the 60s, no such grumbles were heard about the pawnbroker, because primarily in the 60s, the bar was much lower. No popular representations of the Holocaust had ever gone as far to let us know what had actually transpired. But at the same time, to value the film solely on that basis runs the risk of today rendering the film unimportant or even trivial. In other words, if we only value art for its attempts at verisimilitude, then today's graphic and explicit illustrations of the Holocaust, and indeed all warfare, makes a movie like The Pawnbroker obsolete. Yet obviously, and, and I guess this is my opinion, The Pawnbroker is an important movie, not only because it breaks new ground, but because the movie demonstrates that what the Holocaust means to us as Americans changes all the time. In the mid-60s, the relationship between Jews and other ethnic minorities became the subtext for any discussion of the Holocaust. And you know, for those of you who have not seen Liberty Heights, I guess maybe it hasn't come to Muncie yet, it's just come to Indianapolis, but it's a great movie. It's Barry Levinson's new movie, and it's precisely about this topic, so um, I recommend it. But, but while we can conclude that artistic representations of the Holocaust continue to change, in a crucial way, critical reception to them has remained static. Even as artists have placed the Holocaust into their countries and contexts, critics refuse to move forward. Theodore Adorno famously utters 50 years ago this now famous quote, after Auschwitz, there will be no more lyric poetry. Similarly, Claude Lanzmann, the maker of Shoah, has said in an angry comment about Schindler's List that the Holocaust is above all unique and to fictionalize it is a transgression. Obviously, and this is probably not news to this group, Lanzmann is not alone in this belief. The discussion over whether or not there even can be fiction or imaginative responses to the Holocaust has occupied, some might even say stalled, scholars for generations. Some have posited, like Lanzmann, the Holocaust's uniqueness as a reason and some, like Adorno, have said it's unimaginable. Some have just said it's too sacred. Yet I want to suggest that there is another reason that culture critics have refused to let go of verisimilitude as the ultimate artistic goal. For many, like Lanzmann and other contemporary culture critics, to put the words fiction and Holocaust together was to brush up too closely against Plato's notion in Book 10 that all imitation is lies. By imitation, of course, Plato means artistic imitation, both fiction and poetry. And while this admonition always attracts a good deal of undergraduate attention, certainly no contemporary art critic takes it seriously when evaluating fiction, even historical fiction. Yet in the case of Holocaust art, Plato seems to take on new life, for the very idea of fiction appears to run too close to Holocaust denial. It is as if critics believe that if someone could imagine something, anything about the Holocaust, then perhaps the Holocaust itself is imagined. Obviously, such logical fallacies are glaring, yet such conclusions are often hurried to by responsible thinkers. And as such, they indicate a major problematic of representing and, and judging the representations of the Holocaust. The constant threat of running too close to the tracks of denial and the trackers of deniers has inhibited a fair appraisal of several good pieces of contemporary art in our culture. And while it might be argued that at earlier stages in post-war history this was necessary, I remain unconvinced that in the year 2000 critics need to exercise the same bloodhound approach to art in their search for lies, distortions, and inaccuracies. Since 1978, when television aired Holocaust, the program I mentioned earlier, and a program that Eli Wiesel called dangerous and misleading, the desire to tell the real, the whole, the true story has become paramount. As the representation of the Holocaust has become more a part of American popular culture, many have responded with alarm for, and there should be no surprise in this, popular culture is not academic culture, and thus the Holocaust has not been portrayed with the seriousness and the accuracy that many scholars wish for. Um, this might well be cause for alarm, I agree, if at the same time had not come an outpouring of memoir, documentary films, books of histories, dissertations, all of which have been crucial to our cultural reckoning. And make no mistake, in the 90s, or in the O's, as we've decided to say, historical and documentary work continues to thrive. Thus, I feel confident in saying there is room for the imagination and room for fiction, 
even room for popular culture about the Holocaust. We need not be so worried about the specter of denial that creative juices and critical capabilities shut down. While a few malevolent deniers still spew, I do not believe they significantly threaten our understanding of the Holocaust, nor do they pose a threat to an audience like this one, for instance. We needn't unwittingly pay tribute to Holocaust deniers by molding our standard, standards of art because we fear them, or reducing our expectations for our imaginations for the same reason. Neither have responsible historians chosen to acknowledge denial as legitimate enough even to debate. The position of Holocaust scholars has been that debating deniers in print, on television, on the radio, gives these people a podium and an audience. But strangely enough, culture critics have not advanced this far in their own thinking. Instead, many fall victim to the specter of denial because they have not significantly advanced from arguments about verisimilitude. In their critiques, they are still debating the deniers. For what was all the furor about Schindler's List, or more recently, life is beautiful, if not just tortured rehashings of the same argument. That is, these films were not good because they weren't realistic enough, didn't show the event as it really was, didn't act accurately portray the horror, trivialized real events, and gave us feel-good endings. I, I probably shouldn't go on. You've heard it before, and I suspect that some of you may even have mounted such arguments yourselves. But if you have, I want to try to change your mind. Okay. Now I'm going to move to the part about um, life is beautiful. While the criticism of the movie Schindler's List would serve my argument just as well, a, discuss a discussion of the critical reception to life is beautiful seems more timely. In its reception, significant pattern, patterns emerge that illustrate these enduring and problematic patterns in the reception of Holocaust art. Most of the criticism still centers around this notion of reality, or lack thereof. John Simon's review for the National Review was actually titled, Lies Are Unbeautiful, as if that sums up the entire story, as if merely to tell an untruth in the neighborhood of the Holocaust automatically disqualifies the movie from any serious consideration. The story, according to Simon, is preposterous and so unbelievable that he dismisses it outright. Richard Schickel similarly wrote for Time magazine that the brutal reality is never presented and inevitably sees it as a stepping stone to denial, writing, Witnesses to the Holocaust, its living victims, inevitably grow fewer each year. The voices that would deny it ever took place remain strident. In this climate, turning even a small corner of the century's central horror into feel-good entertainment is abhorrent. Sentimentality is a kind of fascism, too. In this way, not only does Schickel liken the movie to denial, but he compares the filmmakers to the Nazis themselves. And indeed, the failure to tell the truth does not, for these critics, denote an aesthetic failure. It denotes a moral one. Perhaps no critic was more outraged by the success of Life is Beautiful than David Denby, who reviewed the movie twice in The New Yorker. To call it bad once for him was not enough. A mystified, incensed, and superior, Denby decries Benini's bad faith. Surely Benini knows, writes Denby, that any child entering Auschwitz would be immediately put to death. Benini wants the authority of the Holocaust without the actuality. And eventually, Denby attributes the success of the movie to the audience being sick to death of the subject. And writes, the audience's mood is understandable, but artists should be made of sterner stuff. He ends his piece by claiming that because the audience can leave the movie feeling relieved and happy, that life is beautiful is a benign form of Holocaust denial. Not only do Denby's words once again draw life from a fear of denial, they also amply illustrate the divide between popular audiences and critics writing for high culture. Denby forgives the misguided public. They don't know any better. If they like the movie, it's only because they lack the knowledge and the vision to truly understand the damage that they have seen. This antagonism between critics for high culture and the popular audience is certainly not unusual. But in representing the Holocaust, it does, I would argue, take on troubling ramifications. For critics of high culture seem so invested in discrediting what they see as trivial or untrue, they completely overlook the wider beneficial aspects of these productions. One is living in an ivory tower of theoretical speculations if you cannot see the cultural benefits that a movie like Schindler has achieved. 
But for some, the audience's strong reaction was made to be a problem as well. If the audience wept, they were weeping at the wrong things, or better yet, they should not have been weeping at all. One should not, critics have written, have a cathartic experience when witnessing representations of the Holocaust. Catharsis makes you feel better, and the audience must never leave feeling better. One must sit through the movie, as Lanzmann has said, of Shoah, dry-eyed. This is his quote. This kind of condescending control that Denby and Lanzmann want to exercise over audience reaction, again, is not particular to the Holocaust. This kind of hostility between academic culture and popular culture seems entirely typical to us in the last 80 years, though I want to suggest that in its applic applicability to the Holocaust, it requires a self-destructive resonance. For the whole point of Holocaust studies as an enterprise has been the, to make the public aware, to broaden its understanding, and to teach perhaps comparable lessons about to contemporary culture, or in other words, to counter the very forces of denial. In other words, Holocaust awareness has had to be more than an academic exercise. The benefits of mass public awareness of the event seemed, and rightly so, more significant than a precise reading of the event in the narrow halls of academe. Is it more important that professors, exactly 2% of the population have it right, or is it better if 50 or 60 or 70% have it almost right? I am not the first to notice that the tendency for academics to take these rigid and perfectionist views about representations of the Holocaust but does not help, but rather hinder a broader cultural reckoning with the subject. Moreover, the paradox that lies beneath, beneath these evaluative frameworks of the Holocaust is intellectually suspect. For at the same time that critics loudly complain that the Holocaust cannot ever truly be represented, they also complain when representations fail to meet that very challenge. While it is understandable that critics might be interested in pointing out where fiction strays from fact, to judge any artwork on the basis of that digression makes it a fait accompli. All artwork will fail. And the most important point here is the one missed time and time again by those who write about the Holocaust. That is, all artworks, whether about the Holocaust or not, do fail this test. As Plato tells us, art will only imitate. But this limitation, this insufficiency, should be celebrated rather than continually bewailed. For were one to claim that any representation did, in fact, fully and satisfactorily portray all the aspects of the Holocaust, then one might be committing the grossest error of all. It is time to incorporate our knowledge about the insufficiency of art into our descriptions of Holocaust art. In other words, let's do more than say, no representation of the Holocaust will ever equal the experience and then complain when it doesn't. It's time to move on. Recognizing the basic insufficiency of art to represent this event as it actually was should not scare us. It should make us relieved. Of course, there are risks. But if audiences leave movie theaters or read poems by people who were not there and thus never really appreciate the true horror of it, the true barbarism, well, whoever said they would. No artistic representation does that. This is the, this is the message that survivors have been telling us and that literary critics and, and cultural critics have not heard. Writing back to Denby in a letter to the New Yorker, a, a reader wrote that she herself is a survivor. And not only does she object to Denby's review because she loved the movie Life is Beautiful, she says that she was a child hidden in the camps and protected by her mother, and she survived. Now what can we make of Denby's vociferous objections? Denby, of course, still has every right to dislike the movie, but not on the basis he claims nor does he have the right to tell his readers that they must abhor it because it is a form of Holocaust denial. Moreover, in the job that Denby has assigned himself, which is, I would call him, a caretaker of commemoration, sworn to protect the sanctity of Holocaust memory and to safeguard against distortions, he's just been proven unqualified. I mean, if you remember, Denby had said it could not have happened this way, and this woman wrote in and said, but it did. Um, Denby's problem, like so many other culture critics, is that he has confused his job. And Denby is not alone. This is a common confusion when it comes to talking about the whole Holocaust. And I'm not talking about old arguments for, about politics versus art. This is, I mean, art critics have every right and even a duty, in my opinion, to judge the morality of a piece. 
but it is surprising to me that art critics consider lapses of realism as moral lapses. Imagination can be immoral, but it is not automatically so. If Denby dislikes the movie, he should object to it on the basis of aesthetic criteria, not because in real life it didn't happen that way. For the truth is Denby, like everybody else who wasn't there, will never know what it was really like. And moreover, since he has based his objections to the movie on the certainty that, he, that it could not happen that way, and he has proven wrong, then we have no more reason to trust him or to read him anymore. Like, I don't. <laughs> In this talk, I've been suggesting that the special demands made on artistic representations of the Holocaust in our culture may once have been necessary, but today are counterproductive. If we say that art about the Holocaust should be held, as, held to the same standards as art about the Civil War, for instance, I do not deny the Holocaust's unique place in history. We merely acknowledge that Holocaust art is just art. It is not and never can be the actual thing. While the Holocaust itself might be, might be as a historical event incomparable, though this itself is a widely controversial claim, Holocaust art is just art and nothing more. This is not to deny the Holocaust. To the contrary, it preserves the sacredness of the event by precisely embracing the doctrines that critics have used to discredit artistic representations. In other words, art is only representation. It, is, it will only render this event peripherally in shadows, in glimpses, inaccurately, in perspectival dis distortions, always insufficiently. This, by the way, suggests one of the most important accomplishments of a movie like The Pawnbroker. Pawnbroker. There was my New York accent. Pawn <laughs> It portrays the insufficiency of art and the insufficiency of memory vividly. It teaches a lesson that all of us who study the Holocaust should take seriously. Similarly, I would argue that one of the virtues of a film like Life is, Life is Beautiful is that it does not inundate, inundate, overwhelm, or even desensitize us to the barbarism of the Holocaust. This is Jeffrey Hartman's argument, by the way. He, he's argued that these kind of portrayals, these extreme portrayals of violence and warfare and in the Holocaust and um, in film and fiction actually desensitize the viewer to the real horror. Life is Beautiful acknowledges at the start that it is a myth. And in so doing, it clearly, and I believe more honestly than other films that insist upon their historical veracity, accepts its limitations. Instead, Benini defamiliarizes the event by choosing one aspect of psychological suffering among all the possibilities of the infinite suffering of the Holocaust and this, the relationship between parent and child, and enlarges it to a point where I, for one, as a parent, felt the pain to be almost intolerable. That Benini can defamiliarize one aspect of the Holocaust enough to make viewers feel it all over again is actually a great accomplishment. If we, as Jews and as Americans, think the story is important enough to bear telling again and again, then we must continue to find new ways to tell it. If Denby is right that Americans are in fact sick to death of hearing about it, then more than ever, artists need to be encouraged to re-see and re-say it. Um, I'm reminded of um, the, the did anybody, has anybody, does anybody see Annie Hall anymore? Did, did you remember the movie? Well, the main character, Woody Allen, is kind of obsessively interested in the Holocaust and he keeps on taking his Gentile girlfriend to see the sorrow and the pity. And it, you know, every day he sort of drags her back to the sorrow and the pity, and that's because he, he can't move on. I mean, there's a way that I think there's like an analogy here. But perversely, those critics who have condemned Life is Beautiful, as well as other unrealistic responses to the Holocaust, have incorrectly given the impression that the Holocaust can be, will be, and ought to be rendered in some perfect form, form of authenticity and actuality. They also say that representations of the Holocaust have continued to make progress in their ability to render this event as it actually transpired. This myth of progress toward a goal of ultimate perfection suggests that we have entered a period where we believe we have an understanding of the event and how best to render and perceive that event. And obviously such conclusions are always diluted. Rather than put, pat ourselves on the back in our new enlightenment, we need to take our clues from the survivors who know that no film or no book will completely succeed in telling us how it really was, yet that does not stop us from appreciating these works. 
Moreover, I believe there is a certain kind of Holocaust criticism typified by the remarks of Denby and Simon of which we should be cautious. We would do well to remind these critics that no artistic representation, whether it is about the Holocaust or not, ever fully renders experience. As philosopher W.J.T. Mitchell has written, the problem with representation might be summarized by reversing the traditional slogan of the American Revolution. Instead of no taxation without representation, we should say no representation without taxation. In other words, every representation exacts some cost in the form of lost immediacy, presence, or truth in the form of a gap between intention and realization, original and, co and copy. Simply put, that is the frustration of art. For the Holocaust especially, the story that could never be told but must be told, in the words of Elie Wiesel, that frustration will be felt more acutely. I would further caution that the divide between academic culture and popular culture shows little signs of narrowing, and I suspect that it will continue to separate scholars from more casual audiences in Holocaust studies and elsewhere. Scholars will no doubt continue to express their dissatisfaction with crass commercialization and simple-minded appropriations. But so be it. In the case of the representation of the Holocaust, scholars need to exert themselves more carefully and look at these artifacts of popularization. Quite a difference resides between a film like Life is Beautiful and, let's say, uh, Johnny Cochran's closing statement in The Simpson Case, where, as you may remember, he compares the LAPD to Nazis, which was another big contro controversy in Holocaust studies. But to lump these two popular uses of the Holocaust together as illustrating the transgressions and limitations of American audiences is to err, err by what re rhetoric handbooks frequently call gross generalizations. We should demand that scholars and critics do better than that. If the face of the Holocaust is changing, then we need to carefully document and understand those changes we don't need to stand on the sidelines waving our arms, blindly yelling, foul. Thank you. That's <laughs> yeah. I just want to say that not only did I enjoy your talk, but I completely agree with you. Mm -hmm. And I want to uh, just say that uh, you were brilliant. <laughs> I Come happen again. to be a film scholar <laughs> really? and also a historian of the Holocaust. And what you said is absolutely 100% great. Oh, thank you so much. I'd like to add that I'm glad I put in my hearing aid. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure when you were sitting there, you were smiling so much. I thought, well, maybe he's really not listening. You know, maybe he's just sort of. Uh, well, tell me what you thought about Life is Beautiful. Well, I agree with you. Uh, and um, the, the fact that you captured the uh, idea of having one emotion, one relationship between the father and the boy, and of course, don't forget about the wife too, mm -hmm. the family. That did more to communicate to people what the Holocaust was all about, not the realistic, but just one aspect of it. But that, in a country where everybody talks family values, that's what made that film so great. And Schindler's List. Now there's where St Steven Spielberg happens to be one of the most brilliant filmmakers. Now, it's true he's a commercial filmmaker, so what? But he used every technique of film that had ever been developed and every aspect of the Holocaust in a way that communicated in a broad sense what had happened. So anyway, that's all I have to say. Yeah, I mean, I didn't say this in the paper, but I mean, I've obviously been studying the Holocaust for a while, and one of the things that always got to me as a parent was, what was that precise worry? You, you know, there's all sorts of helplessness that one feels in sort of looking at the Holocaust, but I always thought, you know, if it were happening to my daughter, you know, if they were carrying my daughter away, what would I do? And you know, that feeling of sort of complete powerlessness, and I, I really had never seen, it was just about that issue for me, that movie, and I just thought, it addressed it so wonderfully that I became enraged when I would read people like David Denby who just wanted to throw it out whole because it wasn't realistic enough. You know? Well, that's what made it so brilliant because yeah. it could appeal to everybody. I, I, I bet you that anti-Semites love the film too. Yeah. <laughs>
No, really. And I know, and I don't know if people in the, you know, people who aren't academics know how controversial these movies have been, you know, because like a movie like Schindler's List, which wins all these awards, and you know, on one level seems like Spielberg is everybody's hero. I, I don't know if people are aware that in sort of Holocaust studies, that movie was sort of uniformly, well, almost uniformly derided. Why? Because of what? The happy ending, you know, people, you know, which just wasn't relentless enough, you know, at the end where they. I don't exactly call that a happy ending. But some people did survive. I yeah. mean, uh, not e not everybody died, and the, the oh, state of Israel was that. a result of this. Yeah. The one thing that you touched on but didn't um, go into depth, uh, you mentioned about violence. It so happens that people will turn off to too much violence, mm -hmm. and in the fifties, uh, there was a movement for this realistic view of the Holocaust with actual newsreels of the camps, mm. shoveling bodies with bulldozers, yeah. and those films were shown all over Germany on television. Well, what do you think people did? Click, and when nobody would go to uh, films like that because they didn't want to deal with it. Nobody, everybody looks away when they see a homeless person. Well, what do you think they're gonna do when they see uh, the, the uh, um, free, when they free the camps? They look away. They don't want to deal with it. So the way to get under the radar is what uh, Spielberg and Benini do. They get under the radar, and then that makes an impact. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, I was glad also that you addressed um, communicating to the audiences and knowing which audience you're dealing with. Because raising children, that's, and when I told my daughter that I was coming here tonight to hear this, hi, Bob. <laughs> that uh, I said, are you still learning? They're in middle school. Are you still hearing about the Holocaust? Is it part of your curriculum? And she said, well, and had to think about it. So right there, it's not in the forefront as much as it should be. Um, and that may be that they're just not able to dedicate, or they're just not dedicating enough time to world history. But um, that aside, she said, oh, wait a minute. I did just go to the play of Anne Frank. So it seems like this impressionable age that is extremely desensitized to violence. Oh, yeah. Extremely. That audience that is wide open to learning is still being limited to Anne Frank. They're not going beyond Holocaust education beyond Anne Frank. Yeah, well, and I think these kids are very capable of more. Well, you, uh, a friend of mine, uh, uh, Ed Butler, was just teaching a freshman writing seminar and it was on prison literature. And he did a unit on the Holocaust, and I think he used Primo Levi's um, Survival at Auschwitz, and um, the students um, just wouldn't read it. I mean, they just down out wouldn't read it, but I mean, what, what they said was, oh, we're sick to death of this. I mean, the same comment that Denby makes, you know, oh, we got this, you know, we got it in high school, we got it in junior high, how much more of this do we have to take? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, students today are not very good readers, and that's a very difficult text, and I think it's more likely that it is, as you say, that it's just, or maybe as you say, that people just don't want to be confronted with that level. Um, I, just, I think it's important to continue offering a variety of mediums, whether it's entertainment, whether it's violent, whether it's newsreels, actual newsreels, because there are plenty. Yeah, yeah. everybody it's saw Schindler's everything. List. That, that was the miracle. We want to talk about the miracle of Schindler's there. List, that everybody saw it. And I think it, it opens up an avenue of communication. It may be narrow, but as long, and then that needs to stay open. And then, like you're teaching a child, you go from that step to the next one and, and just keep going. But I was disappointed that, that her first remark, oh, yeah, and Frank. I was like, oh. So, you know, critics more. are just uh, in a tear in, in Holocaust studies. Critics are just in a tear about Anne Frank. I mean, there, there's been one article after another denouncing it. There, recently, a book came out uh, called The Buying and Selling of the Holocaust. I can't remember the name of the writer right now. But it takes a couple of really important documents about the Holocaust and talks about how it's kind of appropriated the Holocaust for capitalist purposes, et cetera. And Anne Frank is one of the, doc one of the books talked about. And then Cynthia Ozick, a name you probably know, she wrote an article in The New Yorker a couple of years ago saying that she wished the book had never come to light, that she wished the book had been burned because it has so much sort of taken over the discussion of the Holocaust and it's so trivialized what, you know, 
the Holocaust means to people because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't get realistic enough. So, yeah. Well, I maybe I've missed something uh, from uh, and had not read all of these these great criticisms, but uh, it, it's or not so great. Yeah. Well, but, but I I just don't understand it. Uh, you know, I've read uh, you know some of the history. I've seen the movies like like so many others. Um, why? <laughs> I, again, why, why, why is why is this happening? They they do portray the scenes. They do uh, tell uh, what happened or try. I mean, some better than others, obviously. But uh, what what are these critics? Well, does it make going sense for? to you at all in terms of Life Is Beautiful? Have you seen Life Is Beautiful? Yes. So does it make sense to you that people were complaining about that movie? Well, well, no. I suppose they could criticize it in some aspect of of the type of film, but the story, the people, the aspect of what they were trying to represent, you know, this this one one little family in Italy going going through this, the relationship, the parent, the child, and, and you know, they had the, the non Jewish wife and the whole bit going through this. Yeah, I, I thought it was a, a it was a great story. Well I'll tell you what my friend Jackie said when I started talking about it. I mean she hated the movie and again she was one of the motivators of this paper. Um, was that, you know, it was ridiculous that how could a concentration camp look that way? That concentration camp was clean, and it was um, hygienic, um, you know, they played music. I mean, you know, if you compare that depiction of a concentration camp with, I think, probably what we all pretty much know, or at least 90% know of what the camp was like, and, you know, people walk away from that movie thinking that somehow that reduces the tragedy of the Holocaust, that people are never gonna understand how really bad it was if movies like that are proliferated. So people can walk away and say to themselves, which I think, I think this line of argument is absurd, but I mean, I'm just sort of going through it. You know, people can walk away and say, oh, you see, Jews made too much of that. They, they made it sound like the concentration camps were really bad. Concentration camps aren't really bad. Look how they were depicted in Life is Beautiful. They didn't look so bad to me, right? So, that, so they walk away and say that. But those, I mean, I think precisely the people who say that, I mean, that's why I sort of talk about denial in here. The, those people are the people who we need to sort of get out of the picture. Those are the people that are holding us back. In other words, we're so afraid that people are talking all the time, looking for evidence at every corner that the Holocaust didn't happen, that it sort of infects all of our viewpoints about the Holocaust. And, I'm not saying there's no denial out there. Denial is out there, but I just believe those people are going to deny no matter what we do, you know, no matter what kind of movie Benini makes, they're going to continue. They don't need reason or logic to deny the Holocaust. That's so, you know, why are we always responding to that? Just as an aside, and it's not in your field, but how would these people feel if we started denying that the, the atomic bomb happened? That we didn't drop the bomb on, on Japan? There are people who do that. Yeah. Really? Yeah. really? Yeah. Have they, have we, are we there at all? <laughs> uh, that it didn't happen? That's okay. right. Uh, yeah, uh, but I mean, I think that the position that people have taken about Holocaust denial, um, which is, you know, not to argue it, not to debate it, is precisely the right one. I mean, I mean, these, I mean, these people are vicious. I mean, these people don't have good intentions. They don't have intellectual intentions. They're anti-Semites. And they're straightforwardly anti-Semites. And I, I think to hide it under sort of any intellectual rubric at all. I'm sure you all followed this case with Deborah Lipstadt. Um, you know, and the judge, he was great about it. I mean, he basically said, you know, the guy's a nut. I mean, you know, yeah. guy's an anti-Semite. Yeah. Um, I'm John Rouse. When you say anti-Semite, are you saying anti-Jewish or anti-Semite? I mean, it's part, part of my ignorance. Now. Are you focusing on anti-Jews or anti- I mean, primarily anti-Jewish. Okay. Um, I had a chance to go to Auschwitz about 20 years ago and had a profound in, a, impact on my life in, in many respects. I mean, you know, once you go to Auschwitz, you, you, you can't deny these kinds of things. You don't think you can. I've also traveled throughout Germany looking for artifacts and this sort of thing. Okay, I, I'm, the next thing is a, a quote from uh, Peter Drucker says that every 50 years, the people of that new generation can't recognize what happened during their grandparents' generation. And so everything is, like if you're a baseball fan now, it's hard for you to go back to the 50s with the Red Sox, for example. No, it's, it's easy for me to go back to the 50s. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's hard to come back. 
Uh, so, so I'm really getting to a point. Uh, uh, and my concern, what is the relationship between the Holocaust and political correctness? Are we going to ever come to the point where we can have discussions and not feel, and I have to be uh, uh, a Gentile, Caucasian, quite obviously, but I'm, gen I'm Gentile, I'm raised Christian, you know. I mean, can we come to the point that we don't, that the Christians don't feel uh, badly or guilty if they say something or, and the same thing is true with blacks. If you look at the O.J. Simpson thing, that we can't, that the, that the officer couldn't say, that he couldn't say the word nigger, because a nigger is like a, is a person, is a black person of lower economic class. So he couldn't, he had to lie about it. And so, are we going to ever move, given Drucker's statement, are we going to ever move away from this, this political correctness where we can deal with each other more honestly and not according to political correctness? Do, does, do you follow what I'm saying? Sort of, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I think the answer to this is really in good intentions. I mean, I, I have many discussions in my classes where we talk about race, where I talk about the Holocaust with Gentile kids. I mean, you know, kids who really want to know who really care, who are well motivated. I mean, I think I can take just about any question from them. I mean, I think that there's a way that we have to be not so sensitive. But on the other hand, I think that intentions matter a lot. I mean, I, I can also recognize kids who are not so well-intentioned, who want to get a crack in. And um, I mean, I think you have to judge each case individually. I mean, I would say as, as a teacher that I think a lot of good comes from confrontation. I mean, not, you know, vicious confrontation, but I mean, I, I think a lot of good has come when white kids have said, you know, to black kids, I've always wondered about this, or can you talk about this? And, you know, same thing on the Jewish Gentile thing. I was just talking about this at dinner. I mean, I teach the Holocaust to kids who are 99.9% .9 Gentile. Um, and they have a lot of questions about it. They, they have a lot of curiosity about it, and uh, they feel shy about asking the questions of me because I'm Jewish. But, but when they can be motivated to do that, it's great. I mean, it's a really wonderful experience for them. So, I mean, I, I think you have to judge each case individually, and I think it's about intention, really. I mean, I don't want to comment on what the LAPD's um, intentions were, the O.J. Simpson thing. I think I'll just stay away well, from well, that. Well, I'll <laughs> comment on that, since I brought it up. Uh, I mean, in, in all ethnic groups, there's a lower, lower economic class. And Caucasians can't tell economic, economic characteristics from racial characteristics. In other words, people see race and they don't see poor people who are acting differently than middle class people act. And, and, and I mean, O.J. Simpson was a rich man. He, was, he, was a, he happened to be black, and he was a rich man. And uh, so, so uh, I mean, we have to. I mean, some, I mean, sometimes we get culture and economics and politics all, all confused, and we don't make those distinctions. I would agree. Yeah. Are there uh, these criticisms of the Holocaust uh, representations that you're talking about? Um, is this paralleled in other kinds of uh, literature and art for other subjects? I mean, is, is this maybe this is a, a sign of the times, uh, this kind of criticism? Well, this is sort of, a, I mean, it's sort of related to what your husband yeah. asked, because, I mean, I think that there is this uh, necessity sometimes on the part of academic critics to look at what's popular and automatically say it's no good. I mean, this has, like, been an enduring um, dynamic, I'd say, in so literary. New, yeah, right, new. in literary studies. I mean, you know, if a book sells a million copies, yeah. it's trash. You know, it's like, I mean, it's like this relationship that, that can't be escaped. But, I mean, as, I mean, I, and I do think it's inescapable in some ways, but I mean, what I wanted to point out in this paper was that in, in the Holocaust, I think it's really dangerous. Because I, I think they want to take these sort of popular representations of the Holocaust and just throw them out. 
and say we would be better off without them. And what I want to say is, no, we wouldn't be better off without them. You know, you might have like a scholarly monograph of 5,000 pages about what actually transpired in the concentration camps, and it might be, you know, as accurate as it possibly can be, but who cares? You know, it's a, there's a wonderful movie, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, called Son of Fire, or it was made um, a few years ago, and it has this Jewish substance of fire. I actually recommend this movie. It's about this. It's about a publisher who only wants to publish historical treaties about the Holocaust, and it's about how he goes out of business and ends up, you know, kind of on skid row, and uh, you know. But I mean, he wants to, he wants to tell it. You know, he wants people to know how it was. But at some, but you know, on some level, we never get to know how it was, and that's why I think, the, and that's what I think these survivors know. You know, they know. There's a corollary here in that. In the last 10 years, there's been uh, a move to try to get oral and visual history of some of the survivors now, and there have been some wonderful documentaries of people who talk about it, and actually, I don't know if you've seen Talk for Out, mm -hmm. about the survivor who uh, went, and went back with the camera crew to experience the whole thing, and how she was uh, sent to Denmark and was saved and so on and so forth. But the fact is that, by being uh, kind of realistic, might satisfy some of these critics. But again, it was done in a very artistic way. And uh, I think she also liked uh, Life is Beautiful. Yeah. And the one that won that award, um, Gerda and Kurt Lerner, do you know the story? He liberates, he liberates her from the concentration right. camp. Mm -hmm. I mean, that also, I think, is I don't think there is a Holocaust that could be captured. The show I watched all 7,000 hours of it was mm -hmm. Twitter. And there were a lot of different stories. And, and a lot of the survivors talking had very different experiences. Very important and, and profound to them, but, but very different. Yeah. You can't capture that. There's a movement in, in the writing of history back in the late 19th century, German historians, who are going to write history because I didn't live the base as it actually was. Yeah. I should take that phrase from you. Yeah, yeah. You came. You passed. But the Holocaust has been perceived as so sacred that there's been this idea that it will be, that one day we will get there. And I was going to bring up that point. Do you, you said that some of this, you feel that some of this criticism is dangerous. Uh, but do you think it might also be healthy in a way because it uh, maybe maybe we've gotten to the point where people can talk about the Holocaust and criticize it and it's not so sacrosanct that it can't be spoken about as other subjects and topics. I, I, I think it would be good to move in that direction. I mean, I know that that does break some really inviolable precept. I mean, I don't think anybody else in here does Holocaust studies, but I can imagine being at a conference where people would get up and a room and start shouting at me for saying that. Um, mm. I, I think it's inevitable. I think that whatever these guys, and it's not just guys, but whatever, but whatever these people think, it's it's got to be. I mean, you know, as survivors um, die, as as poets and authors and the second generation and the third generation want to come to this event on their own terms, they're, they're going to have to let it go no matter how much they don't want to let it go. They're, they're going to have to let it go. I mean, you know, once it sort of enters the public discourse, the Holocaust, which people, it seems to me, have wanted it to do, right? That's, I mean, they've wanted the, the Holocaust to be widely known. Um, they don't want it. But once it comes into the public discourse, they can't control how it's used. That's why you get people like Johnny Cochran, you know, making the statements he does. But, you know, that's... That's one of the unfortunate byproducts. I, I still think, overall, it's better to have us, you know, it's better to have the Holocaust be known. And it's out there. It's for everybody. And that's, you know, yeah. Um, one idea, or several ideas that have been coming into my mind, a lot of it's through my classes right now, too. But it seems that in order to be able to go on from an experience like having the Holocaust so close to where it's affected the people in this room immediately, and then looking at the next generation, my children, who are once removed from it already. Um, 
to be able to go on from it, you have to be able to have some kind of closure. And in order to have some kind of closure, you have to have had someone who is responsible, who has apologized, who you can then forgive. Really? And if there's no way, if there's no one person to forgive, because we're talking about humankind, we're talking about SS officers who were possibly also victims because they were military career people doing their job. There is that argument. And it's just, it's very hard to think that we're trying to go on by each one of us finding closure from some sort of involvement with the Holocaust, and we may never have it. I think that's true. I mean, I think, I mean, Eli Wiesel has this famous quote where he says, um, in order to understand modern man, you need to understand the Holocaust. And uh, you can understand the Holocaust. I mean, when you start, I mean, you know, the conclusions that one comes to is that, you know, man has the potential for great evil. Um, you know, it's not something you tell eight-year-olds or 10-year-olds. I mean, they, <laughs> they unfortunately will come to this on their own. But, um, I mean, I see it with my students. I mean, it just absolutely sort of boggles all their capabilities for understanding. I mean, how do you understand something like that? I mean, I, and if somebody were to apologize, would it make a difference? You well, know? and the thing is, too, the Pope the, apologized. Know, the histories were the generations who would be the ones that some might feel need to apologize. They are going to go away, and then there's, there is only going to be memory left. I'm scared Eventually. to death about, I have to tell you, you know, I have a five-year-old and a seven-year-old, and because of my work, the word the Holocaust is often said in my house. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had a book, you know, my book's been on the coffee table, and she reads, and, you know, I have been preparing for what I'm going to say when she says to me, Mommy, what is the Holocaust? You know, frankly, I can't believe that she hasn't asked me yet, because she's a very bright little girl, and she asked me all the other questions, but I think she senses that there's something about this topic that we're not going to talk about. You know, I don't know why, but, uh, I mean, what do you say? What, what am I possibly going to say to that question? You know, I really follow the lead. What, what is going to be the impact of, uh, uh, and, and this is a bit, it's becoming a very secular country, what's going to be the impact of worldwide secularization on the memory of the Holocaust? Well, you know, this is what they wanted to do with the Holocaust Museum. This is what the fight was about. I mean, they had these sort of two camps. One, and Berenbaum, the guy who won, the guy who became the first the director of the museum, was saying, you know, we have to Americanize this. In other words, we have to make it an event that is linked to American culture, that seems part of American culture. And, and Berenbaum won. And I, I mean, I do think that the Holocaust <laughs> Museum is a secular institution. I mean, over 60% of the people who visit the Holocaust Museum are actually not Jewish. And I mean, I haven't spoken to every single person who's gone in there, obviously, but sort of anecdotally, and from when I've been there, it seems that, you know, Jews and Gentiles alike are equally moved. So in some ways, I think this has already been, um, and also the, you know, when people compare it to other things, and this is, again is for good and bad. I mean, one of the perhaps detrimental, um, I don't know, what should I say, outgrowths of this whole discussion is the comparison of the Holocaust to American slavery. I mean, I mean, a lot of African Americans have felt angry that there's no um, museum to American slavery on the mall. You know, that's that's kind of been a discussion too. So that's kind of the positive and the negative effects of Americanization, right there. <clears throat> Talking about Americanizing, you know, the Holocaust, I I can't help but think well, there are a lot of nationalities uh, of Jews who were involved in that. Uh, and not all of them came to America afterwards. How are these things, these films, these discussions, um, these criticisms, how are they handled in other countries? I realize that's a pretty broad No, it's, area, it's huge and it's fascinating. And, and you know, the most fascinating place to look at it, obviously, is Germany. You know, following any of the stuff that's going on in contemporary German culture, it's, I mean, they really have a lot of work to do over there. Um, there's a book, um, actually became an Oprah Winfrey book selection, um, The Reader by Bernard mm -hmm. Schlink, which is about how Germany is. I mean, there's, there's a lot to say about this topic. I'm not an expert about other countries. I, I was recently at a panel discussion where somebody, you know, got up and said, well, you've done all this work about America. What about the French? And I said, well, <laughs> you know, I'm sure it's very fascinating in France, too. And, 
you should go write that book, but I'm writing about America, <laughs> which, you know, seemed to calm her down a little bit. No, I mean, I think every nation has their own history and their own relationship with it. And what about Poland? I mean, that would be another place where it seems to me that they have a, a lot of work to do in sort of coming to a cultural reckoning with it. And I don't know if you read this article in the New York Times Magazine section a couple of years ago about all these people in Poland kind of converting to Judaism now. They have these sort of small pockets of Jewish converts who are setting up Jewish rituals, and, and it was this guilt thing that they felt that they needed to sort of repopulate the Jewish communities. You know, it was sort of young, rebellious teenagers. Teenagers, you know, young people, yeah. You may have talked about this earlier today. Uh, we're having all of our incoming freshmen read these yeah, night. Uh, and I wondered if you could give us some uh, tips on how to make that a successful uh, activity. <laughs> The text is pretty powerful. Um, I don't know what Wiesel will talk about when he's here. I imagine that if he talks about his experiences directly, that that cannot fail to move them. Um, I've seen students with all sorts of survivors who really are. Yeah, do you, do you know what he's going to be talking about at all? No, he had a bunch of topics that were yeah, possible. No. I don't know what the con no. conclusion no. was. The main thing is we got them here. Yeah. You well, know, it's hard. It's the date again. The 21st. The 21st. Oh. September. 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 I'm actually going to bring my students to that. But um, it's, I'll tell you this, though. I mean, as a sort of tip for potential teachers, it's hard to advance students beyond just an initial emotional reaction of horror. Mm -hmm. I mean, this kind of emotional, oh, I can't believe it. How did this happen? This is so terrible. They have a real resistance to talking about it as literature. I mean, I remember um, recently I wanted to talk about how he crafted the text, right? I mean, I wanted to talk about it as a piece of literature because it really is a very heavily crafted text. And the students were outraged by that. I mean, they said, what do you mean? He just, you know, he just wrote the story as it actually happened. And I say, well, but what about this? You know, well, what about these 10 years? What happened to them? And, why does he tell us this story? It actually reminded me of when I taught the autobiography of Malcolm X, which I think is a sacred text for African-American students. And I said the same question. You know, I could have got to class and started to talk about how the text was crafted. And it was sort of like, you know, talking about how the Bible was crafted for, you know, fundamentalist Christians. Like, what do you mean? Oops. You know, yeah. You know, what do you mean? And he didn't, he didn't, this isn't art. This is his life. This is the truth. So, I mean, I guess if you want to get your students past that, reaction, isn't it hard? His first expression after 10 years of hiatus, why, why that first, first time? You know, not, not, uh, not to tell you anything you don't want to know, but um, Eli Wiesel in the academic community has become a little bit of a problem. I mean, people feel angry at him. You know that. I mean, For what reason? Why? He's become a celebrity. Well, that, they did the same thing to Margaret Mead. Yes. <laughs> no. So she became popular. Right, she's no good. Right. Yeah. He's, he's too much of a celebrity. He's made too much money off, you know, well, that joke about there's no business like show a business. Okay, when it happens, <laughs> when, when it, when it happens to you, you'll see what it's like. To. What happens to me, yeah, right. you should live so long. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when I become rich and famous off my whole right. <laughs> Jacques Cousteau has the same reputation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not in the end, like he owned the ocean. It's jealous. Yeah. It's just yeah. jealous. Yeah. yeah. They should, they should only sell as many books as he has or whatever. And obviously what he has done for Holocaust studies is irreplaceable. I mean, it's just invaluable. Yeah. In your studies, do you have any intention or is there a plan to, to put together a curriculum for, um, for teaching to make available to different ages at this age group? This would be, these movies would be helpful. These outlines might be helpful in discussion to move. From well, this summer, for the first time, I'm doing a seminar at Butler um, for high school teachers, mm -hmm. um, teaching the literature of the Holocaust at a high school level. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I have something worked out at a university level, and now I'm doing the high school. I don't know, maybe as my children get older, I might be <laughs> more interested in sort of going to the middle I school. I daughter may end up being a tool. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Um, but right now, I'm sort of just at university and high school. But I will tell you that the Holocaust Museum has excellent, excellent resources on this. I mean, yeah, one of the greatest things about the Holocaust Museum is if you go there and you're an educator, I mean, the whole bottom floor of the basement is sort of set up for precisely that, for educating people and giving out syllabi. So you actually don't need me here. It's, it's, it's been done. And they, they actually give out a big pamphlet, and not a pamphlet, more, you know, more like a magazine, which sort of goes through all this stuff. And I'll actually look at that myself to sort of think about high school. Because I have to think about that, too. I mean, as I make the transition between university and high school, I have to start thinking about what's appropriate at different levels. Speaking of teaching kids, my brother-in-law is a junior high school vice president. has a bunch of military uniforms and has their students put on some of these military uniforms mm -hmm. and do some marching up and down the hall. Mm -hmm. So these are German yeah, uniforms. And then my sister, his, his wife, asked me, what do you think about this? You know, what about the age group? You know, what can you teach certain age groups? Is that an appropriate way of trying to talk about issues of the Holocaust? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't like to see it. Yeah. I'd like to ask you about the artifacts, especially a place like Auschwitz. Do you think that it will be preserved, say, in a hundred years? Wow. Or like know. the crystal ball. <laughs> or, or I don't know. What does everybody think? I mean, I don't know. It's, it, it, yeah. it is important to preserve the artifacts, right? Yeah, I, w I think it is. I mean, obviously a lot of the stuff is in the museum now, and one yeah. would assume the museum will stand for a long time. I actually have not been to Auschwitz. I don't I don't know what's there. Or s Did somebody say they were there? Or where are you going to say that? Well, I, I was at Sachsenhausen uh, recently, uh, and that was an eye-opener uh, to me. I would answer that the Germans need to help them confront themselves with their past, mm -hmm. they need to have the artifacts there, they need to have the museums, they need to have the memory. And so, yes, it will be there in a hundred years. But, well, but the Polish government decided that for their country. Yeah, yeah a long time. It's a Polish uh, museum. I mean, one would assume unless there's some horrible event that, you know, I mean, you can predict, but it seems like people are in place. You are getting a backlash, as you probably are aware, among the youth today in Germany. Germany. To say why, why, why beat us up? We right. had nothing to do with it. Right. Why do we have to travel with this guilt? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you bet. Yeah. Why do we have to travel with this guilt on our shoulders? We yeah. can do it. We're Forget it. it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know that's what happened with World War One, and that's how we got World War Two. I mean, yeah. There's an author. I'm not sure if it's Rochelle Millen from Wittenberg University in Ohio talks about how should should the Jewish population make their identity out of the Holocaust. Yeah. And the, the topic of your of your message tonight, the changing face of the Holocaust, how do you look at that or how do you address that? Well, I mean, I don't know how many of you saw Peter Novick. I mean, I heard he was here last month, but this is one of the things that Peter Novick is so unhappy about, the idea that Americans, Jewish Americans, have taken too much of their identity from the Holocaust. And there's been a lot written about that. Victim psychology. Yeah, yeah. victim psychology. There's this book, Why Should Jews Survive, by uh, Michael Goldberg, where he calls you know, these people who sort of worship the Holocaust uh, a cult. Mm -hmm. And you know, basically draws on the problem of people who are going to look at sort of genocide as their defining event as being a problem. But this is what the '60s were about. I mean, when I talk about um, you know, each decade seems to be characterized by certain forms of identification with the Holocaust. I mean, you definitely talk about the late '60s through the '70s as being about that. The Holocaust is a primary mode of Jewish American identification. I think. And I, again, I'd be interested in your opinion about this. Certainly in what I've seen in Indianapolis, the synagogues seem to be very much working against that now. In other words, if they want the center of Judaism to be much more spiritual, um, you know, they don't want it, the Holocaust to be 
the defining event. You know, the old joke about, you know, the synagogue needs more money, so the rabbi gets up and just sort of, you know, talks about the Holocaust, so everybody empties their pockets. You know, I mean, it's not a joke, but, you know, this old adage about that. I, I mean, I, in my experience, I think synagogues are moving away from that. Um, I hope that's the case, anyway. But if you've gotten Peter Novick on this topic, I'm sure he would have had a few things to say. I mean, he's furious about it. If you read his book, you'll see that. Yeah. A lot of agencies seem to have some defining moments and perhaps go overboard for a while. The Vietnam generation has a lot of those similar things. Yeah. Every Vietnam veteran was spit on at the airport when they came home. If you ask them. If you ask them. Yeah. No, of course they didn't. You know, one of the most them. interesting things actually is the 40s. I don't, like um, Gentleman's Agreement mm -hmm. and yes. Crossfire, and uh, the Crossfire was this movie about anti-Semitism. There's another big movie about anti-Semitism where they were just, they didn't want to talk about the Holocaust. People were afraid to talk about it, so instead they took the topic of anti-Semitism and just tried to sort of portray it as un-American. You know, we're, we're not anti-Semites here, we're Americans, which is basically like the film of Gentleman's Agreement. Um, and uh, there's another movie in that line too. But in 1961, everything changes with the Adolf Eichmann trial. You know, every generation sort of has its, its moment. Anybody? Are we done? What was the <laughs> movie that you said had just come to Indianapolis? Um, Liberty Heights. Liberty Heights? Yeah. Barry Levinson, you probably know him. He did Diner. And uh, he also the, did The Tin Man. And Avalon, 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 which is about, and this is another study of, it's about Jews in the 50s trying to assimilate alongside blacks who are also trying to assimilate. So it's really about blacks and Jews, and the Holocaust sort of is in the background there. You'll sort of see that. Do you get, do you get, do you have an art theater in Muncie? We have just one in Indianapolis. It's called the Castleton. Oh yeah, so you've got the same one looks at the Castleton. So <laughs> if it's still there. We actually just got another one in Indianapolis, so that makes two. It's Art theater, what's that? <laughs> There's one they we have just the University Film Series. Do you have that? Yeah. We don't have that. We don't Where have the the I'm sorry? Where is the second? Um, right near the University of Indianapolis. They sort of got this old building and they converted it to, I haven't been down there yet because it's, it's far. It's too far south. It's too far south. Yeah, it's the south side. University of Indianapolis. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.